Hi, welcome to Understanding Behavior. This is a workshop for caregivers. My name is Nicole and I am a special education teacher and a um, board certified behavior analyst. So today we're gonna learn a more in-depth way of understanding behavior. Um, you're gonna learn some new key concepts about behavior that will enable you to view your child's behavior in a new way. Um, you're going to learn key principles of behavior that will help you better analyze your child's behavior. Um, you'll learn new tools um, in determining the function of their behavior. And in turn, you're going to be able to make more functional plans to change um, any challenging behavior. So first, we really need to define what we mean by behavior. Um, behavior is an action that can be observed and counted or timed. So when we're talking about um, behavior change or teaching new behaviors, we wanna make sure that the behavior we're talking about is something that you can see. Um, it must be something that is observed, something that can be counted. So how many times the behavior occurs, um, or it must be able to be timed, right? So how long is this behavior lasting? Really almost everything we do can be described as behavior, but I want you to be weary of um, that you're not using thinking and feeling statements, especially when you're talking about your children, because you may think you know how they're feeling. You may think you know what they're thinking, but the truth is that you are not able to observe other people's um, thinking and feeling, and therefore those are not behaviors that we're targeting. So make sure that when we're talking about specific behavior that either we want to see increasing or decreasing, it's something that we can see. I'd like us to look at four key concepts of behavior to better understand. The first one is that behavior, we want to think of behavior in two categories, either adaptive, which means behavior that we want to see right? It's behavior that helps us or maladaptive. And those are our challenging um, disruptive behaviors that we want to see decrease. The second is that all behavior is learned. And that means both the adaptive and maladaptive behaviors. The third is that <clears throat> behavior is a form of communication. Um, we do things to communicate something. And the fourth is that behavior serves a function. And there are actually only four possible functions of all behavior, and you'll learn them today. So let's look at adaptive versus maladaptive. So again, our adaptive behavior enables us to get along in our environment. Having adaptive behavior, um, like getting dressed, putting a seatbelt on, asking for help. These are all helping us um, learn new skills, become independent, um, function independently, um, create relationships, and just get along within our community. Maladaptive behavior is the behavior that really impedes on all of those things. So it impedes on our ability to function independently, to have relationships, um, and to gain access to new learning opportunities, right? Something with these two categories is that while we wanna see the maladaptive behaviors decreasing, we also wanna see the adaptive behaviors increasing because oftentimes the maladaptive behavior is occurring because our kids don't have the skills to um, behave in an adaptive way. So I want us to remember that as we move forward, that we don't just wanna see the bad behavior go away, we wanna see skills increase. The next concept is that all behavior is learned. Behaviors do not just happen out of nowhere and for no reasons, right? So we're gonna look at behavior and kind of what sets up the likelihood that a behavior is gonna happen. And we call that the environment, okay? And by environment, we mean 
We many things. It could be the place. It could be the time of day. Um, it could be the sort of stimuli in the environment. If it's loud or quiet or dark, um, it could be a certain person within the environment or something in the environment that might sort of increase the likelihood that a behavior is going to happen. And then we have the response to the behavior. And the response to a behavior is super important because it's what happens right after, but it's important because it will either increase the likelihood that the behavior is gonna happen again, or it decreases the likelihood that a behavior will happen again. Let's look at this um, example. So you have a child um, and a parent. The parent places a demand on a child. So it doesn't matter what the demand is. The demand just means, you know, something the child is supposed to do. After the, after the parent places the demand, the child runs away from the parent. And that's our behavior right there. Child runs away. Now, what comes next is called the response or consequence to the behavior. Parent removes the demand. Now let's see. The consequence to the child running away is that the parent then removes the demand. And in turn then the child gets to escape the demand and then the behavior is reinforced. And when a behavior is reinforced, it increases the likelihood that it's gonna happen again and again and again, and that is the learning process. The third concept we have here is that behavior is a form of communication. So what is my child trying to say? One of the biggest challenges parents face is trying to figure out why their child is engaging in these certain problematic behaviors. Um, we often hear, I don't know what's happening out of nowhere or for no reason at all, right? What we need to remember is that children with autism um, and uh, so many other disabilities have difficulties with communication. They might find it hard to tell you if something's bothering them or um, if they want something and they might not have the communication skills. And it has just become effective for them to engage in these maladaptive behaviors, right? Um, even kids that have the verbal skills, um, even kids that are, you know, neurotypically developing, um, if they're in a state of um, frustration or um, angry or, you know, having, having a hard time, they may have a harder time finding their words too. So behavior is often actually a really effective um, form of communication because it kind of does the job. And we see that. So when your child is having a behavior, it's important to remember they're not doing it to um, be bad. It's not something that's coming out of nowhere, that it is a form of communication and you need to stop in the moment Take a pause and think to yourself, what is my child trying to communicate? Behavior serves a function. This is my favorite part because I think it's the coolest. And you're going to um, learn today how you're going to figure out what the function of your child's behavior is. Um, you're going to become your own uh, scientist detectives, okay? There are only four possible reasons why behavior occurs, only four. The first is escape avoidance, to get away, to escape or avoid an aversive stimuli. And that's science talk, but aversive stimuli just means something they don't like. Could be a person, could be an event, could be a place, could be a sound, could be anything. It's something that they do not like and they engage in a behavior to escape that thing or avoid it. The second one is attention. This is to gain attention from another person. I do something to get attention from mom. I do something to get attention from dad. Now remember that all of these functions 
are applicable to both maladaptive and adaptive behavior. So there's appropriate ways to gain attention and there's inappropriate ways to gain attention. The next is tangible. We call it tangible because it's to get something, to obtain something. I do something to get what I want or to gain access to something desired, okay? That too could be an item or an activity, okay? And then the fourth is what we call automatic. Another word um, used for this function is called sensory, okay? It's more of an internal thing. Um, it's I do something because it feels good inside or I do something because it makes me feel less anxious. Okay, so let's look at some examples of these behaviors or uh, functions, right? A person does, for this is escape avoidance function, a person does something to escape or avoid something they don't want. So example, a child sees broccoli on their plate, yuck, and pushes the plate away. Now I bolded in each example the behavior. because I want us to start being able to analyze each scenario and and uh, define or um, identify the behavior, okay? So the child sees broccoli and pushes the plate away. Mom says it's time for school, child runs away. Dad says time to leave the park and the child flops to the ground. They go boneless. Friend doesn't want to go to the party, so she lies and says, I'm not feeling well, right? lying to escape something you don't want. No, none of us are guilty of that. Mom's phone rings, mom presses the red decline button. She doesn't have time for a phone call right now. Let's look at the next function, tangible. A person does something to get something. So example, child says water, water, and dad gives a cup of water. That worked. Child grabs the cookie out of the brother's hand child eats the cookie, they got it. That is not an, uh, right? That's not an appropriate behavior. That's a maladaptive behavior, but he was able to get it, right? So likelihood is gonna, he's gonna do it again. Mom makes coffee, she drinks the coffee. Student asks for a hall pass, hall pass please. Teacher gives hall pass. Baby cries, mom gives baby a bottle of milk. Child opens the toy cabinet, child takes the toy they want. And dad turns, that's old school, turns the TV on, dad watches the news, okay? So I do something to get something I want. The next function, attention. So a person does something to gain attention. The child says, look, mom. Mom looks at the child. He gets mom's attention. Baby cries, mom picks baby up and gives kisses. Baby gets mom's attention. Son taps on his dad's shoulder and dad turns and looks at him. He got dad's attention. Teacher claps her hands. All the students stop and look at her. She got the student's attention. Students raise hand for teacher's attention. Person screams in a crowd, people turn and look. And lastly, we have the function of automatic um, or sensory. A person does something because it feels good. So we sometimes see this as stereotypic behavior for kids on the autism spectrum, um, but we all engage in automatic behaviors. Um, child may flap their arms because it feels good, um, a behavior we see sometimes, right? Um, but here's another one where, you know, we do it at ourselves. Mom stretches ugh, during a long meeting. Oh, it feels good, it's keeping me awake. Student taps his pencil on desk during test taking. And maybe he likes the sound, right? Maybe it helps him focus. Child makes vibrations in throat. Mm -hmm. I had a student that used to do that. Women, a woman takes deep breaths before the plane takes off. They're feeling, she's feeling anxious and breathing helps her. Child rocks back and forth while watching a movie, okay? 
so the idea, right, that be these behaviors are learned, right, is a is really better understood when we look at something called the ABC model. The A stands for antecedent, and that's what occurs immediately before the target behavior. So we were talking about the environment before, setting up the likelihood a behavior will occur. So the antecedent is included in that, okay? Then we look at the behavior, which is the target behavior observed, and it's going to be very descriptive and observe, you have to, it has to be observable, and I'll explain how to define behavior in a moment. And then we have the consequence or the response. This is what happens right after the target behavior. So when we look at this, one, two, three, it's called a three-term contingency. Each thing is contingent upon the other, okay? When we look at this, when we look at um, patterns of this, it's gonna help us understand when, these, when a behavior occurs, what the behavior looks like, and then why it's happening. It's also gonna help us be able to create more of an effective behavior plan when we know the function of the behavior. So let's check out the antecedent. So again, it's a situation that comes before the behavior. Sometimes we use the word trigger to a behavior or a cue for the behavior. Um, the antecedent could be an event going on. It could be a person who's in the environment. Um, it could be an object in the environment. Here are some examples. Alarm clocks sound. Hearing that sound is an antecedent to getting out of bed or pushing the snooze button. When we see a stop sign, it's the antecedent to us pressing the brakes. Hearing a screaming baby might be the antecedent to, oh, I know that scream, I gotta make a bottle fast. Dad telling their child to clean up the toys could be an antecedent to them starting to whine. Okay, that's the antecedent. Let's do a little practice. Number one, Susan hits Fred after he takes the book she is looking at. Now, when we look at each of these examples, it's helpful to first identify the behavior. So the behavior we are looking at here is hitting. Susan hit her, I'm assuming brother. So Susan hit after he takes the book she's looking at. Ah, Fred took the book from Susan and then she hit him. The antecedent to hitting was that he took the book. Let's look at number two. Mary starts to interrupt her father by screaming hmm, when he is talking on the phone. I see that the behavior is screaming and the antecedent is her dad is talking on the phone. Yes, she wants his attention. Randy throws his vegetables after his mother puts them on his plate mother puts veggies on plate is the antecedent to Randy throwing them. Noah screams when he sees the playground on the way to the doctor's office. Scream is the behavior. What happened right before the scream? He saw the playground. Mm, he wanted to get that playground. He did not want to go to the doctor. Now let's check out behavior. And I mentioned earlier, it's important to define a target behavior very specifically and in a detailed way. This is very important because especially we want to um, communicate best with teachers, with therapists, with doctors, and we wanna define this target behavior so we know that we're all talking about the same thing. So we have to use very specific and detailed descriptions when defining a behavior. So everyone understands what's happening and what it looks like. Let's check out some examples. Here's an exchange between a mother and a clinician. Mom says, Tom has been disobedient at home. Is he bad during therapy? So 
I see these words being used, disobedient and bad. The clinician says, eh, Tom's usually good, but sometimes he can be stubborn. Good, stubborn. Hmm. How much do we know about the behavior at home and in therapy by these words? The mother and the teacher are using words that are very vague, right? I don't know what's happening. I can, def I can picture a million things that look disobedient or bad or good or stubborn, right? Let's look at the second exchange. Tom has been hitting me at home. Is he hitting during therapy? No, he hasn't hit me, but he has pulled my hair. Hmm. So now they're using terms like hitting, which is something that I think is pretty descriptive, right? I can picture hitting and pulling hair. I know what that looks like. So now I know that mom and clinician are really on the same page and they're talking about specific observable behavior. This is a better way. And now we know when, we're, when we have these exchanges with teachers and therapists and doctors, we need to be very specific with the behaviors that we're seeing. Aggressive is a word that we hear very often, right, with our kiddos. And again, aggressive, aggressive is a very vague term. We have to think of other ways to describe the behavior. Here's just a few examples. Hits others, that is an aggressive behavior, yes, but it's a specific. Bites others, screams at others, throws objects. Disruptive. That's a pretty vague term. What does disruptive mean? Let's see, it could mean talks while others are speaking. That's a disruptive behavior. Sits on my lap while I'm working. Yes, that's disruptive. My son does that a lot. Or calls out in class. Those are all disruptive behaviors that look very different. Let's look at the last part of our ABC model, consequence. So again, a consequence can be described as um, a, um, a um, response to a behavior, sorry, describes what comes immediately after the behavior. So consequences can be natural or contrived, right? An example of a natural consequence is you touching a hot stove, the consequences that you get burned. But then there's contrived consequences, and those are the ones that we need and to think about because we have a lot of control over the consequences of our child's behavior. So a consequence that reinforces the behavior, and I'll explain this a little bit more in detail in a little bit, but this idea that a consequence reinforces the behavior will actually make it more likely that the behavior is going to occur again in the future, okay? If a consequence punishes the behavior, then the behavior is less likely to occur again in the future or over time, okay? I'll show you some examples here. So consequences that reinforce. When I do something, I get what I want. Hmm, it worked. When I do something, I get out of that thing I didn't want. So let's look at the functions here. When I do something, I get what I want. That's that tangible function, remember? When I do something, I get out of that thing I didn't want. Ooh, that's escape avoidance function. When I do something, I get attention, attention function. When I do something, it feels good. That's that automatic or sensory. So if something, if a behavior is reinforced again, it increases the likelihood that the behavior will happen again in the future. Now look, look at punishing. When I do something, I don't get what I want. I did something and it didn't work. I did not get that toy or I did not get um, the cookie from the cabinet or I did not get the iPad that time. Um, it didn't work. So because it didn't work, it's called punishing. And I know that term sounds um, harsh, but it's just a behavioral term. It, all it means is that it decreases the likelihood that the behavior is going to happen again. Let's look at this one. When I do something, I don't get out of what I want, right? 
they wanted to get out of something, they tried to kick and scream, but they still had to empty the dishwasher, right? When I do something, I I get something that I didn't want. So this might mean, hmm, I did something and then I had to do extra cleaning. I had to do an extra chore because I did this thing that was bad. Or when I do something, it doesn't get me attention. It didn't work. Or when I do something, it really doesn't feel good. So I pressed that, I touched that hot stove and I got a burn that did not feel good. So these punish, punishing consequences decrease the likelihood that the behavior is gonna happen again in the future. So let's look at some examples to help us kind of tie everything in and identify the functions. Ryan is given, and here we have these A, B, C, and then we're gonna circle a possible function. And I will say that there are some scenarios, right? Some behaviors that do have multiple functions. We're gonna identify the main function, but I will show you how they can have multiple functions or um, an additional function that kind of maintains the behavior. Ryan is given a turkey sandwich for lunch. Ryan falls to the floor and screams that he wants Pop-Tarts. So his mom takes the sandwich away and makes the Pop-Tarts. What do we think the function of his behavior is? Well, we can say, hmm, he really wanted the Pop-Tarts. So the function would be to get what he wants. I could also see how it would be escape avoidance because he's trying to escape the turkey sandwich. But this is most likely he knew mom was gonna give him something else. So let's go with that. But remember, it could be both. The next example, Ryan gets in the car to drive to school. Ryan starts flapping his hands. His mother turns on the radio on a, to his favorite station. Hmm. Well, I don't know Ryan well, but I'm going to assume that this is automatically rewarding, an automatic behavior for Ryan because he flaps his hands in a variety of situations. There's no correlation between flapping hands and the radio getting turned on. So I'm going to say automatically rewarding. Ryan's mother sits next to her husband on the couch. Ryan, sitting across the room, cries and whines. His mother then gets up and sits next to him and soothes him. What do we think the function of this behavior is? Attention seeking, and he got it. The last example, Ryan's mother tells him to do his homework. Ryan runs away into his bedroom. His mother lets him stay there because he's being quiet. Hmm, what was the function of that behavior? Escape avoidance, right? And he got it. <laughs> so let's do a little practice. Michael is watching cartoons with his brother in, uh, in the family room. His brother changes the channel. Michael hits his brother. His mother immediately scolds him and sends him to his room. Hmm. So again, it's important in this scenario to first determine what the behavior is that we're looking at. And in this scenario, Michael hitting his brother, that is the behavior that we're looking at. And we need to identify what comes right before, hmm, what comes before Michael hitting his brother is his brother changes the channel. The consequence, hmm, what did mom do? She scolded him and sent him to his room. So let's determine what the possible function of behavior is. Michael hits his brother after he changes the channel. So I'm going to say that Michael wanted the channel back to where it was. So that is a tangible function. Now let's look at the consequence and we wanna ask ourselves, did the consequence reinforce or punish the behavior. Now, this is where we as parents or caregivers will have more control, right? So we see this behavior, are we going to reinforce it? Did mom reinforce it? 
And I'm, by reinforce, I want to look at the function. The function here is to get the channel back. Did he get the channel back? No, he didn't. He got scolded. So the behavior of hitting was punished, meaning he did not get the channel back. He did not get what he wants. So mom was smart. She knew if I let him get the channel back, he's going to hit his brother again next time. So I'm not letting that happen. I want to stop this behavior. I want to punish it. Let's look at another example. Susie is playing a game on the computer when her father tells her that it's time to turn it off so she can start her homework. Susie falls to the floor screaming and kicking in an attempt to stop Susie from waking her baby sister from her nap. Susie's father tells her that she can have a few more minutes on the computer. I am guilty of this, right? So turn off the iPad, Wah! fine, you can have a few more minutes. And we think in the moment, right? We think in the moment, okay, baby's still asleep. I don't have to deal with her screaming, like all good, everything's cool. Mm, good for the moment, not good for the future, right? So let's check out the behavior. We know what the behavior is, right? Susie falls to the floor, screaming and kicking. Right before the behavior occurs, the father tells her to turn the computer off, right? The consequence is in turn that she gets more time on the computer. So what do we think the function is? Tangible, right? To get more computer time. And the consequence, well, that reinforced the behavior. So Susie's gonna be kicking and screaming every time dad says, time to turn it off. So we have these scenarios, right? but it's so important for us to know what the function of the behavior is. I'm gonna give you an example and we're gonna play around and see what happens if the function's different, right? So this will show you how it's so important for you to know what the function of your child's behavior is before you decide what your plan is gonna be. Student is being disruptive in the classroom, making paper airplanes, talking loudly, making goofy noises. The teacher sends him to the principal's office because he is being disruptive. When we know this happens all the time, right? So it helps the teacher in the moment, making sure that the other 20 kids in the classroom um, are able to focus. And this one kid goes away. And again, everything is, you know, all good for now. But was it the right decision? Was the consequence a good choice, right? So let's see. What if that student's behavior was functioning to escape from doing classwork? Did the, did the teacher's uh, consequence reinforce or punish the behavior? So if he was looking to get out of classwork, then the consequence really reinforced it. It increased the likelihood that the behavior is gonna happen again. So this teacher is gonna to have to deal with this kid doing this on, on a daily basis now, because he learned, huh, I just have to make a ruckus in the classroom and then she sends me out and I don't care if I get in trouble as long as I don't have to do the classwork, right? Now take this same exact scenario, same antecedent, same behavior, same consequence, but the function's different. Now, the function of this behavior was actually to gain attention from his classmates who were cracking up laughing. But the teacher sending him to the principal's office removes all that attention. And therefore, her consequence then decreased the likelihood the behavior will happen again. So this is why it's so, so, so important for us to understand and know and determine what the function of the behavior is. And this is how we do it. We take data and you're gonna learn how to do it too. Um, and it's very important and, and, and it's pretty easy, so don't get discouraged, okay? It's really not always easy to understand the function, right? So that's why we do this functional assessment. And we keep data for just a few days, right? It's called an AB, it's on that ABC model. 
and it's gonna help us determine the function. Okay, so we gather information and I'll show you what it looks like. So we have here an ABC data sheet. So here you will recognize antecedent, right? What happened right before. Behavior, which is what it looks like. And the consequence, which is what happened after the behavior occurred. So we also have all this information, which will be really relevant to us determining different um, patterns. So we have the date here, the beginning and ending time. So this will be important too, because um, you wanna see if behavior is occurring at a specific time of day. Um, you may also want to sort of see how long a behavior is occurring, because as we start to target behaviors and they might have a behavior that you wanna decrease, you might wanna see the time the behavior lasts shorten. The setting, is important, right? So um, that's the environment we were talking about. What activity was going on? Maybe who was involved or who was present? A, B, C, and then here, you'll be able to, to indicate what you think is the possible function, okay? And we have here hypothesized because it really is an educated guess, okay? Um, what you will do is I'm going to give you a copy of this ABC data sheet. I will put um, a link in the chat at the end, and you will be able to print this out at home and keep it in a safe place and take data. You're going to decide a target behavior that you're going to choose, and you're going to write all this information out, and it's going to give you good information. And this is just an example of one that's been filled out. Um, date here, so you, you will probably, or most likely, have multiple entries per day, right? Um, you're going to write the settings. You could see here the different rooms that the behavior occurred in, the activity that was happening, okay? Who was involved? The antecedent, the behavior, which is very clear, right? Sam swiped the bowl onto floor. Sam flopped to the floor and kicked and screamed. Sam leaped over the table and grabbed a handful of cookies. Um, the consequence, what happens after, and then your hypothesized function. Let's check out this video. I want you to watch this video and We'll watch it once. I want you to look at the um, antecedent behavior and consequence and try to determine the function. Um, and um, you could think about maybe what the mom did, what the boy did, and whether or not the consequence reinforced the function, reinforced the behavior, or punished the behavior. Can I have a brownie? Oh, not right now, honey. All right, it's lunchtime. But why? Because it's lunchtime. It's not time for brownies. Open it. I said it's not time for brownies. Open it. Don't. Open it. All right, you can have one. One brownie. That's it now. We're going to check out how would we fill out this ABC data sheet. So we have the date here, the time it happens, 1130. Uh, only I have 1130 to 1131. It was really only a minute long. It was in the dining room. The activity, there really was no activity going on. It was kind of like a transition. Like, I don't know what he was supposed to be doing. Um, so he was just walking around. Um, mom was involved. Um, antecedent, son asked for brownies and was told no, it's time for lunch. So he was really told no, which so many of our kids have a hard time with, right? The behavior, son asked again, so he said, gimme, um, pushed box on into mom and then stomped up and down. So that's how I described the behavior. And the consequence was mom gave him, oh, just one, 
And she probably thought that that was the punishment. Oh, just one, you can have the whole box, right? So the function we know was tangible. He did that stuff because he was trying to get access to that brownie and we know he got it. So the consequence reinforced the behavior. He's gonna do it again, probably. Okay, so here's um, another, you know, scenario we can analyze. Um, ben and his mom are checking out at the grocery store. Ben asks his mom for candy and mom says no. Ben begins to loudly repeat his request. Mom repeats no a few times and then ignores Ben while placing the groceries on the conveyor belt. This is a very classic, classic example. Ben begins screaming, I want candy and crying. Mom ignores him, she does a good job for about 30 seconds, but then eventually gives Ben the candy. Ben immediately calms down and patiently holds his candy to be scanned. So what has Ben learned here? Well, the behavior of screaming, I want candy and crying will get me the candy. And something important to note here is that mom held off. She didn't give him the candy for a full 30 seconds before she gave in. This is a big mistake we make as parents. And I always, when I coach parents and say, if you're not in the mood to deal with a tantrum, if you are not in the mood or, or unable to, right? Give in right away. Because what Ben has learned here is that not only does screaming and crying, but mom will give in if I do it for 30 seconds. So the next time she tries to actually, you know, hold off and not give him the candy, he's going to go full blast for 30 seconds, right? And if she says, nope, still not doing it, he's going to keep going and keep going, okay? So if you ever have a moment where you just don't feel like dealing with it and it's, you know, obviously your child will be safe, just give in right away because you don't want them to learn that they can do it for a longer period of time because the next time will be even longer. They're gonna, that'll be their baseline. They're like 30 seconds, oh, I could do a minute now. And then if you give in after a minute, then the next time's gonna be even longer, okay? It's just gonna make it harder for you in the future. Another scenario is bedtime. Bedtime is tough, okay? I know, I have two. Um, Charlie is a seven-year-old male who has difficulty falling asleep and frequently wakes up throughout the night. He has established an established bedtime routine, which includes taking a bath, reading a book, and then mom lays down next to him until he falls asleep. If mom attempts to leave, Charlie has tantrums involving crying, whining, and leaving the room. He immediately calms down when his mom returns. When he wakes up at night, Charlie goes and wakes his mom up and asks her to return to his room, which she eventually does. What has he learned? So tantrums get what I want. Tantrums, which are crying, whining, leaving the room, right? Tantrums work. I get mom back. Um, I wake up in the middle of the night. I don't stay in my bed. I go get mom and she comes. So these are all learned behaviors, right? So I added some reviews here for some of the concepts and terms, okay, for your reference. And then what I want you guys to do as caregivers, this is your to-do list. You need to print the ABC data sheets, okay? And you're going to print a bunch of them. If you don't have a printer, that's totally fine. You can take a piece of paper and Make make a grid and just do it that way. You can record the information. As long as you have all of that information written down in any way, shape or form, that's fine. It's, it's the same information. So um, you can have a notebook, whatever, you, however you choose to do it. But the ABC data sheets are there for you to use. Um, you need to record data for a target behavior or behaviors. And I suggest you pick just one to start. <clears throat> Maybe something that you really want to see change. Um, it's easier to start with one because you'll start to get used to how to collect the data. 
Um, and also we never um, try to uh, work on a bunch of behavior at the same time. It's just too difficult, okay? So with the data, you're gonna take for a few days, you're then gonna analyze the data with these questions. So do I see common triggers? So you're gonna look at that antecedent, the time of day, the, um, the location, um, the people, you're gonna look at all that and see if you find any patterns. And then you're going to see if you can identify the functions, the probable functions with your hypothesis, okay? As you look at your ABC, your antecedent, your behavior, your consequence, you're gonna decide um, what the possible function is, right? Were you able to analyze the consequence and determine if the consequence has been actually reinforcing the behavior? Most likely, yes. Um, and then you're gonna try and figure out how you can change the antecedents. So location, things around those trigger things. So that when you look at the antecedents, the environment or those triggers, you can actually use preventative strategies to eliminate those things. And then you can look at the consequences and the consequences you have a lot of control over and you can start to tweak those. Right, so how can I change the antecedent and the consequence in order to decrease the likelihood the behavior is gonna happen again? So last is what adaptive behavior do I need to teach my child to replace the maladaptive behavior? And that was a huge one. You cannot just eliminate problem behavior without teaching new skills. The problem behavior is happening for a reason. There's a function, there's, a, there's, a, there's something going on there that your child is trying to communicate. And if they don't have the skills to do it, you're not gonna see maladaptive behavior decreasing. So we call it a replacement behavior. Are they trying to escape something? Let's teach them how to communicate that. Are they trying to get something? Let's teach them how to ask for things they want and all of that good stuff. So. I want for you, if you need more support with the ABC data collection and analyzing the, the, um, the functional assessment, I want for you to reach out to me and I will help and support you in any way that I can with that process. But I also want you to plan to attend the next workshop, which is about preventative strategies. And that's gonna help you better um, um, manipulate those antecedents in the environment and, and different strategies to help just avoid that challenging behavior. So thank you so much for today. Um, I really look forward to hearing from you and seeing you again. Take care.